Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Eric Kramer of Kramer Custom Knives. Eric's handmade tactical hard use custom knives first turned my head a few years back with his Reaper folding knife, a slightly recurved tanto with a deep spine swale that looked optimized for both thumb placement and standard grip and trapping in reverse grip. And then soon I realized it was based on a fixed blade originally created for the Libra fighting system, and I was totally hooked. Every Kramer custom knife is hand ground, free hand, uh, which makes his work even more impressive. And at this point, I can't decide which model to obsess over the most. Uh, so I'm going to go with the Voodoo or the Do No Harm. But before we dig in, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, stab that notification bell. Also, while you're there, check out our other shows. We have knife review videos, Thursday Night Knives, that's our live stream every Thursday night, and our Knife Junkie Town Halls, where you can meet and talk with makers and personalities that make this whole knife world happen. If you want to support the show, and want to enjoy exclusive opportunities, uh, exclusive content and opportunities, you can do so on Patreon. The quickest way to do that is by going to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Visit the Knife Junkie at thenifejunkie.com to catch all of our podcast episodes, videos, photos, and more. Hey, Eric, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. Uh, it's good to have you here. And uh, well, um, you know, we were talking beforehand. I know you're a bit of an outdoorsman, but I wanted to find out your, you know, your origin story first. I want to find out how you got into knives and, uh, you know, what it was that really got you hooked. Um, I've always had and used knives since I was a little kid. Um, always carried a pocket knife. You know, I went to grew up at a, at a time when you could carry a knife in school and not get the cops call on you, that type of thing. Um, so, you know, I've always been a knife user, not so much on the collector side of it, but, you know, always had a pocket knife. Um, I was in, I spent 20 years in the military and uh, 2004 got into a unit that, so my, my hobby prior to that was, I was, I, I shot a lot. Uh, I spent all week doing a lot of reloading and then sit around and try to shoot one whole groups and, you know, reload for accuracy. And while I was in, in 04, we started up a unit and we started shooting a lot at work and it stopped being uh, a hobby. So basically looking to, for another hobby, you know, something to replace my, you know, in my free time, um, kind of went back to the knives that knife thing and started looking at some of the higher end production stuff and going, ah, you know, how hard could this really be? You know, it's just a ground piece of metal with some parachute cord on it type of a deal. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, found a piece of mild steel in my shop and got a file one day and went to work. And about 12 hours later, I made it look almost something kind of like a knife. <laughs> And it was like, okay, this was really fun, but power tools would help. And then began the 15-year uh, uh, tool collection that I have now. And uh, it's just been constant upgrading equipment. Um, you know, I right off the bat met a couple of uh, other knife makers that were local to me. When I, this was uh, stationed in North Carolina. I got online, got a couple of the forums, and um, linked up with uh, – Jerry McGinnis was the first first guy I met and um, so I'd go down to Jerry's shop and you know get a serious case of tool envy and you know turn some of his steel into dust and then uh, it's just kind of kind of went from there so it's uh, everything that I'm kind of well everything that I'm making now is it's been a um, an evolution of the design. So, you know, you start out and I wanted to make great big herky knives and uh, started putting them into people's hands that were using them or were potentially going to use them. And they're like, dude, this thing weighs a ton. <laughs> uh, and it's, uh, you know, it takes up a lot of room on my belt or my, my kit. And a lot of these guys were either in the military with me or 
working for a contracting company doing things. Um, and you know, essentially they're like, this thing weighs as much as a 30 round magazine. And it's as big, <laughs> you know, I, yeah. it's great, but I can't use it. So, you know, I started you taking the end user feedback and, um, you know, scaling things down and, you know, basically all the designs that I, that I have, that I've, that I've made are based on, um, feedback that I've got from, from people that are using them. It's like, you know, I don't, I, I can make a knife that's really good for going out in the woods and making a shelter and, you know, this and that and the other, but I'm not a karate guy. I don't, you know, all these other little niche knife things. I, I don't do that. I was, that wasn't me. Um, so, you know, when I got out here to San Diego, um, I linked up with Scott Babb that was teaching Libre fighting and was like, well, well you know, I'll give this a shot, you know, cause I found him online and, um, started going to the classes and, you know, about a month and a half in, I finally was like, you know, I didn't tell him, you know, Oh, hey, I want to make this knife. It was kind of, you know, playing it by ear to see what it was all about. And about a, about six weeks into it, I was like, okay, so here's, here's my ulterior motive. This is what I'm wanting to do. And, um, so he got and gave me some criteria. He's like, you know, I'd like it to do this and be about this size. And then I just, you know, went through a couple of prototypes and came up on, uh, there was a first version, which was the, the original Libre fighter. And I think I made 13 of those and, um, turned out it was very close to something else that was already out there. So mm -hmm. I don't know whether I had seen it and just subliminally it was in there, but mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was really close. And I was like, Oh yeah, that's not going to work. So we scrapped that one, redesigned it and then came out with the Mark two and that I've made, I've been making that since 2011, kind of put it into like a semi-retirement phase here over the last couple of years, as far as doing them, you know, and committing entire sheets of steel to it. Like I used to, right. um, but you know, that, that whole Mark two design, um, it, I got it into the right hands of, of people that were, were using it and the feedback that I got from various features of that knife have heavily influenced the design of the stuff that I'm still making. Um, number one, the handle design it's, you know, when I first started out, um, you know, I was playing with the finger, finger grooves in the knife and I made a few of those and I'm like, no, oh, this doesn't feel right. You know, and then I'd make one that felt right for me and then I'd give it, you know, let somebody else play with it. And they're like, Oh man, the, the finger grooves are all weird on this thing. So I think that was the biggest thing was coming up with a handle that has, as far as I know, fit probably 90% of the people that have held it. Um, and then, you know, all the other features on the knife, it's none, no, no one single aspect of that blade design is like, oh, that's, that's a Kramer thing. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, there's nothing of, of any one part of the design that is like, that's, that's an original thing. Everything's been used before. I mean, you know, we've been as, as, a, as a species have been making knives for how many millennia. Um, the chances of you coming up with something that are a brand new thing, uh, that actually functions is, you know, good luck. Um, probably not going to happen. It's the way you put everything together into a complete package. Um, so that's kind of what the, the Mark II became. And, you know, so all the designs are kind of based off of what works, um, to, to put it bluntly. You know, um, well, first of all, thank you for your service. Uh, I, thank you. Uh, yeah. I, um, always a little bit humbled by people who voluntarily put themselves in harm's way to protect me and my family. So thank you very much for that. Um, uh, but something rang true, something a little bit funny. You said that when you first started making knives, you said you were making these big Herc knives and uh, made me think of you know, my childhood watching Arnold Schwarzenegger movies and, uh, you know, the predator machete who doesn't love that giant thing, right? Who didn't, who didn't want that on their belt, but I would imagine with the 50, 60, whatever, however many other pounds you have hanging on your body, the last thing you need is a big boat anchor of a knife. 
Right. So to me, it's kind of interesting that you're, um, you're, you know, it sounds like you, you did some pretty intense uh, military activity. And, you know, we think of those of us who, who weren't involved in that kind of activity, you think of, uh, you know, maybe big intimidating kind of tools, uh, knives and such, but, but the idea of paring it down to something small and usable is, uh, is the reality of it is the, is right. the realistic part of it. Um, so Libra fighting, Libra fighting system. What, what? Tell me a little bit about that and and how it how it influenced your designs, in particular, and if you have any of them at hand uh, to to show as you talk about that. Uh, I have. Uh, I have a blank. Hang on a second. I'm gonna disappear for a second. Sure. So uh, as you know, on this show, I've been talking a lot about the Pical grip. And I know that you know the edge down, edge in, tip down kind of stuff, and that plays heavily into. Um, I, I believe that plays heavily into the libre fighting system. Um, so I'm interested in what uh, I know. You have one called the Amy or the Am, the A M dash. Yeah, I have the the. It's, it's pronounced the Ame, Ame. Um, okay. which is a. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna mess your producer up again and disappear for another second. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, talking about this kind of thing, you know, that you hold down, you know, with the tip down, and you you all know what I'm talking about. It's just a uh, okay, yeah. I'm d I'm done leaving. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's all right. Um, it's all right. So the uh, the Mark II. This is the well a blank for the Mark II. Um, originally they were three sixteenths inch thick um, S thirty five V is what I was making them out of. Um, this one, since I, I, like I said, I'd kind of put them into a semi-retirement state. Um, I'm starting to kind of make a few here and there. This is a one eighth inch uh, CPM 154 because it's mm. currently what I'm using. Um, but, you know, this is the overall blade shape. Oh, let me find my camera there. And, you know, minus a couple of holes, I still have some work to do back here. But this is the... The blade itself so right. um yeah i'm a specific question so, about it or yeah so what are some of the tenets of um libre fighting system that guide your designs so the the swoop in the back was and you you hit on it at the very beginning um in a reverse grip or even in a, a forward grip like this you can use it to to trap and move a blocked appendage or whatever. Um, so that was one of the features it, that we put in there for a, a very specific reason. Um, the second was if the, this tip right here is a very slight recurve. Mm -hmm. So that if you have it in a, in a grip like this, if you're cutting, you're, you're not, the material is getting pulled back in. So it keeps the knife into contact with whatever your, whatever the target is, um, as opposed to something, a more traditional, like a, like a Persian type blade where it's going to, the target's going to roll off of the edge. Right. Um, so that's where that came from. Uh, and then, like I said, the handle length, you know, I use this pretty much handle profile, um, for the voodoos and, you know, a whole lot of other uh, models that I'm making. And if I don't use this specific design, there are certain measurements that are within that that I use because as long as certain fingers hit in a certain spot, I can get the kind of the same feel. So that's but, why that's why the finger groove thing never worked out for you because with this knife and also I noticed uh, with the Do No Harm, which kind of has a uh, symmetrical handle, um, you can turn it around uh, and orient the blade, um, you know, the cutting edge or the primary cutting edge inward without any discomfort. You have all those handle grooves or finger grooves. They're just going to create hot spots in your hand. Right. And I mean, I used one of the, the larger models that I made, I still do occasionally, uh, the Gut Shot Fighter. It had a single finger coil in it. And even that, I mean... I, you can use that in a reverse grip. It's more of a, a big utility knife than anything. I'm, unfortunately, I don't have one here. I don't even have a, a blank of one because I haven't made one in a while. But it was still that index finger drops right in 
to the to the handle and it's even though you can reverse it and you know it still works it just feels odd you know you put it in a, in a forward grip and it feels great it's like oh yeah you know it's, it's made for your hand um so that's why you know i went when i started doing the voodoo like this guy um mm -hmm. you know it's got this same handle profile as that mark ii yeah and tell me, tell me a little bit about the blade. By the way, I love the Voodoo, and you've been posting a lot of them. And you, I think you posted one. I know you posted one today. Double this is the one that I posted and, today with the uh, the, with leather, the sheath. leather sheath. Yeah. By the way, your sheath work is beautiful. We'll get to oh, that. Thank you. Um, but the um, that knife in particular, I'm I'm really loving, and I love that uh, that you put a uh, second edge on it. I, I'm, I'm a sucker for that. And, um, but you've got that primary big bellied, um, sort of clip point there. How is this to, is this not meant to be reversed? Is that, is that the whole meaning of, uh, sharpening the clip there? Uh, you can, I mean, if you, if you go with this in a reverse grip, um, you know, you still, now you have the same thing that I was talking about previously works over here as well. Um, but it's more, obviously it's based on the Mark II design and I really wanted to do a Persian style blade and this is what it came out with. Uh, you know, I had a lot of, uh, a lot of help and feedback from some friends of mine that were like, Oh no, you know, put, move this angle over here. Just the, you know, the aesthetic, uh, the aesthetics of it and you know some a couple of these guys are very familiar with uh anatomy and things and we're like yeah you should put this this angle here for a reason <laughs> so i did um and uh so this is what came out of it so man i i really lo love that knife um so your uh what's your process do you um do you design things by hand draw it all out by hand cut stuff out on your you know on your uh, tell me how you make a knife ideally i would sit down with some some really nice french curves and a, a pad of paper and then i draw something that looks like a three-year-old drew it and i throw that in the trash and then i grab a sharpie and usually something that i've already made that works as a template and i'll just start you know, either go into town on that and just a piece of steel and kind of see where that goes. Or a lot of them are, are modified designs that I already make. Um, you know, the, there's a modified version of the voodoo that's called the Baba Yaga. That's, you know, the, it's off of the same blank and it's just got, it's a voodoo with a belly in it. Um, but that one little grind out of the belly it changes the whole dynamic of the knife. And I mean, it makes it, it, you know, just, it makes it a completely different knife. And, you know, people ask, Oh, well, you know, do you have any of these? I'm like, Oh yeah, I can. Cause you know, it's the same thing. I just take a chunk out of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, if it's something, you know, like a brand new knife, um, like, like I said, I, I have certain, measurements that I use for the handles now. So, you know, I'll start out with that because I know, you know, I want X dimension in, in the grip area. Um, and then I kind of, it'll usually start out in paper mm. and then depending on how the paper comes out, I may finish it all out in paper. If I, if I get it to where I'm happy with that, um, I usually cut one out of steel or just whatever I've got laying around. And once I get it in steel and actually get, get things tweaked and dialed in the way I want. And if I'm going to put it to a pattern then I've been using Kydex for, for pattern material for a while now. Um, it's, I just tend to have a lot of it, you know, laying around in scrap and you know, it's, it's, it's easy to work. And if I screw it up, it's not a big deal. It's more durable um, than cardboard too, or yeah, I, I've used plexiglass for a long time. And the problem with plexiglass is it balls up really bad on the grinder. It just yeah. kind of makes a mess. I mean, Kydex does too, but it's not as bad as, as the, uh, 
as the plexiglass was. So most of the patterns that I have are all, um, you know, chunks of Kydex and there's still some of the old plexiglass ones floating around the shop too. Um, so from that point, um, I can go a hundred percent, um, handmade in here as far as getting the sheet in cutting on the bandsaw. I do my own heat treat right now just because getting the volume up to have it sent out, although it would save me a lot of time and headaches. Um, I just can't get the volume up to, to afford to, to you know, send off 50 knives to make it worth doing it. Mm-hmm. So I do all my own heat treat in here. I do cryo. I have liquid nitrogen in the shop. Um, once I get a design that, you know, people like, and they're, you know, a lot of people are ordering it, then I'll go to, and I'll have a water jet. Um, so you can see them behind me. I have yeah. the skeletons hanging there. Um, I'm not ashamed of it. It, it saves me about two hours per blade and I, it's more efficient. Yeah. Um, because I, it, I average two to four more knives out of a piece of material by having it water jet, just because, you know, a bandsaw, you're very limited on the radiuses you can cut. So I, you wind up with a lot of scrap steel on the floor. And, um, you know, if I'm trying to do this to, to support myself and my family, you know, I, I'm going to take every advantage that I can. Yeah. Um, and the way I see it, it, if I can screw the knife up and there's still plenty of opportunities for me to screw the knife up, it's still handmade. And I've got a pile of dust over there to, it's like, Oh, yep. That one's messed up. It seems like, um, like there, there's, uh, there's something comforting and, and, uh, and like you want the knives, you know, they're, they're all hand ground and handmade and everything, but you know, you, you kind of want to be starting from the same point point each time and and it seems like cutting out a bunch of profiles has to be the most grueling aspect uh, if is. you're if you're going to do everything without a water jet uh to me uh it just un- unless you have a specific love for that part of the process right it just seems like uh that's the place to start because you know uh i'm no knife maker but it seems like uh, bevel grinding has to be a, a huge white knuckle experience because you could, you could screw up a whole knife and put in the bevel on. Like there are a lot of opportunities to mess it up. Right. Uh, you know, uh, after, after that, and there's a lot to perfect there. If you want to sell something that's somewhat regular, you know, people, people, uh, you know, each one of your things is handmade, but people want certain models and they don't right. want it to look like a different one. They want right. it to look like that one. Um, so it seems like that's just kind of a smart move, uh, you know, across the board. Yeah. I mean, in the past I I've had, I've even had handles, um, water jet cut and it's still, everything winds up being fit specifically to the, the individual knife. So, and I've had people, Oh, well, you know, can I just order, you know, X material in this handle? I'm like, yeah, you can, but you have to send me the knife. And I have to fit it to the knife and essentially refinish the entire knife because I grind the the scales right to the tang of the knife. So I don't have the ability yet, which I would love to have, of being able to you know walk over to one drawer, open it up, pick up a set of scales, screw it on, and then mm-hmm. grind the knife out. I mean, there's still a ton of hand finishing, you know, even with the the water jet cut scales. So you know it. I I would love to be able to take this to, you know, kind of the next level of being more of a mid tech uh, operation just to get the volume up. Um, And, you know, and obviously by doing that, you get the volume up, you can bring the price down, but it's, it's, it's kind of that point where, you know, I, I need more money to hire people, but I need people to make more money to hire people. So, it's, yeah. you know, I'm kind of like, yeah, well, I'll just keep making coffee and knives then here the way I'm doing it then. <laughs> so besides the people, what would it, what does that take to go more, uh, to use your words, uh, mid-tech? You know, I, honestly, I don't know. Maybe if I knew that I would have been able to do it by now. I Machines. Like a, like a CNC uh, machines, CNC like machines. I know there's um, double disc grinders that 
you know, essentially are like knife making machines. And, you know, I, I was, I was looking at them or looking for them last year, just kind of out of curiosity and came up on a thread. Uh, I don't remember what form it was on, but basically the guy, whoever posted it was like, there are tons of these old machines around in places, you know, like buck knives and bench made. And they put them in a corner because they're not going to sell a machine that's capable of producing 500 knives in a day to their competition. <laughs> yeah, so they right, set it in the right. corner and just let it rust away because it's like, oh, well, you know, we'll buy a new one, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to give, you know, the competition, the, the leg up to start it. And I'm like, ah, oh, well, okay. I mean, you here know, we are. <laughs> as a, as a collector end user, and this is not going to be of interest to you, but uh, the collector end user is so excited that you're not making more because it brings up the value and the not not just the not just the value of it but the covetability of it you know because it makes yeah. them harder to get and uh, I know that's cold comfort for you but no I mean you know it is what it is it's like I've had I mean I ship knives all over the place um, I've got a couple here that are going to Europe in the morning once I, you know, package them up. Um, I, I've literally, I've shipped knives all over the world and, you know, I, I would love to be able to put more or, you know, not, not that I would stop doing the hundred percent customs. I don't think I ever could. Cause I mean, as, as burned out as I can get on things and I do, I've got the attention span of like a, a five-year-old on sugar. Um, <laughs> I get, I get really bored and, but you know, I, I've thought about doing other stuff and I'm like, no, nah, no. Nah. Cause then I know what's going to happen is I'm like, man, I need, I need to get back out in the garage and make something. Yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, this is, I don't know. I'll, I'll, hopefully I don't mess you guys up. This is the whole shop right here. It's a, a three car garage and I've got it just absolutely crammed full of stuff. So, you know, I've got, a. I, I have two grinders right now I've, at different points in time. I've had people up here um, apprenticing for working for me. Um, and it's just, you know, they, people move on and do other things and it's fine. And I, I enjoy having the, the help up here when I can. Uh, I have a, a young man coming up now on his, what, well, the, they're back in school here four days a week now. So that kind of had to, I was like, oh, you got to take care of your school stuff first. But, you know, this summer, you know, he's going to come up and, you know, at 16 years old, he's he's already got a pretty good grasp on, you know, the mechanics of it. I mean, I can sit him down in front of the bandsaw and he starts pushing stuff through and it's like, all right, you know, he is, but he's also 16 years old and, you know, mm -hmm. so. Well, what, what, what's, I'm um, sorry to interrupt you. What's it like having people in the shop and, and having them producing your work? Uh, well, it's, it's more, it turns into more of a team effort um, mm -hmm. because I've, I haven't had anybody up here of the, of the couple of guys that I've had in here that have came up for extended periods of time. They were more, I, I never had anybody else grinding for me. Um, I was teaching them to grind, um, but never, they, it was never at the point where I could just turn them loose and say, here, you know, grind the stack of blades. Um, it was more fitting up handles and, you know, pre-cutting the handles, drilling, counter boring, um, pushing stuff through the bandsaw if it needed to be cut, um, you know, I don't want to say the un, more unskilled stuff, but everything, stuff. Uh, yeah, apprenticing type stuff. Yeah. So, you know, we never, it, it never got to the point where, you know, three summers ago, I had two guys up here all summer helping me get ready for, um, I think it was the Vegas show and, you know, for three months and, and then one of them ended up coming back up and he worked for me for, for about eight months, um, you know, pretty much full time, but it, it never got past the point of apprentice type stuff. Um, you know, the one guy, I mean, he was, you know, I could say, Hey, we got to put handles on these today. And he knew exactly what to do. 
Um, and then, you know, and it, he was completely upfront with it. You know, he, he wants to make knives. So I'm like, okay, well, you know, come up here and I'll show you how to make knives and you can, you know, you can work for me. So and he did. And, you know, I think he's, he's made a few, but he's, you know, he didn't really have the passion for it and he's kind of moved on to some other things as well. But I mean, he went and bought his own grinder and you know, all that. So I don't mind having people in the shop. I, I enjoy, I enjoy the company. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I, you know, I, I went from uh, being in the military and working with a lot of guys in a pretty close environment to working by myself in the shop. And it's like, wow, this is kind of boring. I'm, I'm not nearly as entertaining as I thought I was. <laughs> so, yeah, right. <laughs> so anybody, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to have anybody come up. Um, I don't mind it at all. I, I enjoy, you know, I enjoy showing the hobby off to guys, especially people that are like a knife maker. People actually make knives. Like, yeah, we, they don't, you know, they don't just come out of a, a gum machine or anything. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so I, I'll get people to come up and, you know, I'm like, Dude, here, here, here's a piece of steel. Go to town on it see what happens. Um, Cause I mean, that's what happened to me, you know? And I think, um, I, I think it's very important for, guys that are that are makers to to keep doing that and keep spreading yeah. you know spreading the 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 art and the hobby of doing this and i'm like you know i tell anybody that asks me it's like you don't need a garage full of crap to make knives you really don't you can have like three pretty basic tools and you can turn out a perfectly functional knife what um, are those three tools for people who uh, a grinder a, a bandsaw and a drill press Okay, four. You need a, a way to heat treat that as well. So some a one uh, a fire brick and the propane torch and some peanut oil. That's how I started, and oh, and a magnet because you have to sit here and do this and see when the magnet stops sticking to the steel. Yeah, and then man. You're that, like, oh, I got it. That list keeps getting longer and longer. <laughs> right. Okay. So I'm up to six. <laughs> but um, you know, everybody's like, well, you know, I've I've got uh, right now I have four drill presses and a mill in here. Everybody's like, oh, you, you, do you need all those? And I'm like, yeah, whenever you're doing, especially when I was doing the folders, I had each drill press set up for a certain operation. And it was, you know, mm -hmm. I had a, a line of little, little bins with all the parts in them. And I just walked down the line and one operation and then to the next operation and not having to switch out a drill bit or, you know, an end mill. It only takes 15, 20 seconds. However, you know, multiply that over 10 and then by the month, it's like, yeah, you save a lot of time. Right. And and each time you change those bits or, or whatever, each time you change the tool, you know, it's not exactly calibrated like it was the last time, I would imagine. I mean, uh, not so much on the on drill, drill bits and stuff. I mean, where that really comes in is is on doing milling, if you change out a milling tool and I, mm -hmm. I, I'm not a machinist by any stretch of the imagination, I have a mill and I can really make a mess out of stuff with it. <laughs> um, but I've, I'm not trained as a machinist. Um, but I've, you know, I, I use it a lot for counter boring handles right now. And, you know, if I, if I have to swap out the end mill for something else, it takes me a few minutes to get it set back up right because it's a certain depth that I go to on the, the handles for the, to, for the screw to hold it on and that type of thing. But it's just a matter of, you know, especially in the folders, just, I, I bitch about folders a lot, but that's kind of why I'm not making folders. I burned out on it. You know, you're dealing with little bitty drill bits and it's like, Oh, I dropped the drill bit. Where'd the drill bit go? And okay. Oh wait, is this the right little bitty drill bit? Oh, well, wrong hole. There's there goes, there goes that titanium. So, uh, yeah. how did you learn folders? I mean, that's a, that's a, seems like a pretty Ugh. big jump. It, I put it off for a long time. Um, it, it was very daunting to get into, um, the, f I bought, well, I've actually found a copy of Bob Terzola's book, the, the tactical folding knife on Google books or something mm. and downloaded that and read it and printed it out and read it and read it. And I think I laminated it with scotch tape at some point. And 
that was essentially what got me moving on it. Um, I did have some help uh, with some of the more critical things like setting the lock and that type of thing, setting the detent ball. Um, and I've, you know, I have some uh, kind of a, a small list of people that I can call and be like, is this the knife maker helpline? Cause I don't know what the hell I'm doing right now. Um, uh, and still, I mean, I, I don't know half of what I don't know at this point about, you know, I make, I make what I make and, you know, I've, there's still several things that I've never done. I've never done a slip joint folder. I've never done a fitted guard. I've never done a hidden tang. You know, it's like all these things that are very classic. Um, and I just, I, you know, creature of habit. I put hole, you know, put holes in the handle and screw the handles to it. And that's how I do it. So, but I want to learn, you know, I, I, I want to expand out and get into these other disciplines or whatever you would call them of, of, uh, you know, other ways to make a knife. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder if, um, if knife makers think it's an obligatory thing, like you have to do folders. Some people, I feel like fixed blades are their stepping stone to folders. And, and, and I, I guess I can understand that from a challenge point of view, but, um, as I, I collect everything, I mean, I, I love, I love I love all the knives. <laughs> I love them all. And, and, uh, I'm, you know, I have a pretty nice, uh, fixed blade, um, collection. And, and, and when I'm in the throes of a fixed blade, like acquisition period, it, it makes me grateful to those who dedicate themselves to that. And I, 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 as a, as a non knife maker, don't feel that, um, that the folder is the be all end all. I, I do understand that it's the easiest to carry for people. So, I mean, naturally I carry my folders way more than my fixed blades, but right. uh, um, I just feel like I, I'm grateful that there are people out there who are, who are focused on fixed blades uh, with, without, without feeling that need that they, they must. Uh, but also I, I understand, you know, once you said, you know, you can get into a, not into a rut, but into a groove with, with something and it becomes kind of uh, automatic, how you would want to change things up and really throw yourself a challenge. And from the looks of your folders, man, you really threw yourself a challenge. They're beautiful, first of all, to look at. I've never held Thank one, you. but they also look incredibly complex to, to, to actually make and make right. Yeah. I don't know how I, uh, you know, I, when I started doing the bolsters on the folders, I, I don't, really remember the whole thought process that was going through my head when I'm like, Oh, well, if I grind this in here. And I, I think, I think it was more aesthetics. Cause you know, I, I have the first, the first folder that I made, I still have here in the shop and it, it had bolsters on it. They were G10 bolsters and it was just a flat, you know, line between the handle and the bolster. Mm. And I think it was pretty soon after that. I'm like, mm, that's boring. You know, it, it just needed something something else to make it pop. So then I started doing the the uh, grinding the forty fives into the you know the dovetailing or the you know I'm not sure what it's called my bad um, and then you can see like the the picture there you know yeah. the backspacer on the first few it just came up like you know halfway across the handle and it it spaced it out and I'm like oh well what if I ground that into that and then as the as time progressed and I kept going through them the backspacer started getting longer and longer and then I had, you know, I was trying to match it up. If you look down the spine of the knife, that angle from the bolsters would continue. And I'm just like, man, I'm getting yes. really off in the weeds on this thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Ooh, that one looks nice. Yeah. Yeah. I see what you mean. The, the, uh, the angle of the bolster continues into that pointy, uh, yeah. um, backspacer. Um, yeah. So, so this, these are liner locks here. Um, I, I was looking around, you know, uh, stalking your, your webpage and you said you were going to get back to them at some point. Um, is that, is that, is, is that something? Is that real? It is. It is something. It is real. And I've been saying it for the last two years and damn it, it's going to happen like <laughs> this year, this summer. Um, no, it's me. I, <laughs> I know. Right. Well, I've got, I, I have for some very specific reasons that I have to do. I have to get back into them. Um, that I can't go into right now, but, okay. um, I, I, well, the other thing I have been wanting to, um, 
but whenever I was making them a lot, I, I was just making them. I didn't write down my process. Mm-hmm. You know, like I said, I was going off of Bob's book that he wrote, which is an amazing book. And he's, it's back in, uh, back in print now. So if anybody's watching this and was like, Oh, I kind of want to make folders buy the book because it's literally the guy that brought the modern tactical folding knife to, you know, to the world right now, he's telling you how to do it. Um, and it's always, you know, stuff like that's always easier if you have somebody that you can physically go to their shop that's doing it and go, okay, it, you know, you can put A and B together and then it's like, oh, okay, I get that. And that's what I've had to do on several occasions while I was doing the folders. But um, I completely just derailed my train of thought there. How about that? <laughs> well, that's all right. Because uh, you know what uh, I'm wondering now is um, I know you started – making them for your military buddies and for your martial arts buddies. Um, who, who are your customers now? I, I, and, and I'll preface that by saying I follow a lot of very interesting uh, Instagram accounts and I see your knives in there. So who are these people? Who's getting your knives? It's a lot of very interesting people. Um, I no, there's, there's a lot of collectors that are doing the, the tactical fixed blade, um, you know, that's, that's what they love. And, mm-hmm. um, and I still get a, a lot of military, a lot of law enforcement. Um, like I said, I, I shipped things all over the world. So I've shipped to some places that I know guys are on active duty right now that, you know, it's uh, hopefully they never have to use them and it's just there to help them, you know, cut paracord or whatever they're doing day to day crap. But, you know, I, most of the stuff that I'm making right now, well, everything's I'm making right now is, you know, it's very purpose built. Um, they're defensive knives. They're made to get yourself out of a bad situation. Um, I'm not, I won't make any bones about it. That's what I'm designing them for. That's one of the things whenever I was making the folders, um, I f- felt like I kind of lost touch with what I was doing for a while because, you know, I started making knives to putting guys hands to work. And then as the folder thing went on, um, you know, I'm putting all this 20, 30 hours of, of my life into this knife, knowing that it's never going to cut anything, yes. um, you know, and getting, getting knives back because the locks are clapped out and I'm like, this thing's, it's never cut anything, but I'm like, well, how, what, what happened to the lock? I'm like, you know, did you spine whack it or, you know, what, why is the lock all shot out on it? And I'm like, Oh, I just sit there, you know, when I'm watching TV and open it and close it and open it. I'm like, you, you've put 20 years of use on a knife in, in a year. Good job. <laughs> yeah, um, right. I mean, it, it's, it's titanium on stainless steel. It's, yeah. I, I don't do the, or I didn't, I don't know. Maybe I'll, maybe that's something I need to look into, but I didn't do the steel inserts on mm-hmm. the lock bars. You have a relatively soft material against a relatively hard material. It wears. It, yeah. it happens. You even car- you, you know carbonize it. Do what you want. It's still softer than the steel. So you know, I got a few of those back, and it was just like, you know, this isn't. I'm not getting the same satisfaction out of it. And it, you know, don't take it the wrong way because it's you know, it's very humbling for me that people will give me their hard earned money for something I make. Sure. And it's not that, you know, I, it's not worth it, but there was just something, this, this satisfaction of, you know, making something, you know, like this, Love that. that is very specific to a very specific task and, you know, putting those out and knowing pretty much that the guys that get them, know what they're going to do with them. Um, and knowing that that knife could save a life literally. Yeah. Because that's what it's designed for. It's designed as a field expedient scalpel. Um, it's, it, it, you know, we can go into more on that, that specific model later, but, um, you know, I, that's what I, I started doing this for and I, I kind of lost that. So I just kind of stepped away from the folders for a while and reconsolidated myself and, probably with some of the same guys that you follow that are kind of interesting on Instagram. And, um, you know, I get a lot of feedback from 
from people that are, you know, end users. So, yeah. well, that's, that's really interesting. Um, a really interesting thought because it's, it's obvious from your fixed blades, what they're made for. And, um, and then you think of, uh, well, the, the, the folder that we just had up on screen with the Damascus steel, the beautiful titanium bolsters, the, the, the really nice handle material. And, and that's just, you know, even though that could that could also save a life, and even though that could be used defensively, first of all, a folder, um, you know, often times without a wave or something that that makes it deploy immediately without the use of fine motor skills, uh, is going to be a less um, effective defensive weapon. You know, yeah. when the chips are down. So uh, that aside, something as fine as that folder. Um, is really going to a different end user, you know it, and it, you know, yeah. and um, and and of course, you know, if you ask me, and I'm sure if you ask you, there's absolutely nothing wrong with with collecting knives and appreciating them for their machining and for their design and for what they are and for right. how they flip open when you're annoying your wife watching TV. Yeah, you know that is a thing. That is a use of a knife. It's uh, you know, but it's such an obvious departure from your bread and butter, uh, and, right. and not even like in terms of the business, but in terms of you know your you know your original mission in these. You know, it's like, uh, let's see, the, the most expensive knife that I've ever bought was a Microtech out the front. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not even sure which one it was. Um, they were set up from me across from me in one of the Vegas shows. And I'm like, okay, I have to do it. And I sat there and annoyed my <laughs> wife the whole show going click, 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 click. <laughs> Did you put that down. Sorry. No. Um, but you know, I, like I said, when I started, you know, I, I was a knife user. I always have been. Um, and I bought knives to use. Um, I, we never got into the collection aspect of it. Um, I get it. I mean, I, you know, I go to these shows and, you know, walk around and, and look at the stuff that guys are making. And it's just like, damn, you know, wow. I, maybe one day I'll get to that, to that level of, you know, being able to pull off a perfectly mirrored finish right. and, you know, that the fit and finish on, you know, going back to the fixed blades, um, a couple of friends of mine that are just amazing fixed blade makers. And it's like, yeah, I need to go hang out with you for a week and, and figure that one out. Cause, uh, my 320 grit, throw it in the sandblaster and tumble it. I, it's not a mirror polish. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So, but I mean, you know, it's, I, I have, this is, this is my, my folder here. This is the only one that I have that this is my user. So it's a, a version of that Reaper and yeah. you can see it. It's pretty beat to hell. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's a, about a 16th of an inch shorter than it was when I put it in my pocket. Cause I've, you know, I use it in the yard. I, I use it and then, yeah. you know, but yeah, I, it, it's it's a completely different market, and you know, I, like I said, I'm gonna get back to it here very soon. But it's it won't be. I don't think it'll be. It's not gonna take the place of the the fixed blades because I need to have that balance. Um, and I want to do some other stuff too. I'm I'm really, uh, I'm really nerding out on uh, daggers right now, and oh. more like historical historical fixed blades. So. Mm -hmm. um, I want to make a V42 dagger and I, I have one that started a couple of years ago. I ended up buying a, uh, a case, one of their replicas yeah. and that, that started it and it just keeps growing. I don't know where all these knives come from in this drawer that I have, the, but the V Oh, <laughs> I have one of those drawers, uh, <laughs> the V42. That's the one with the pointy pommel and it's got the little thumb rest and a kind of a large unsharpened Ricasso before. Ah, uh, uh, we're going to make me drag daggers out. Hold on. Oh yes. Well, sure. <laughs> oh no, please, please don't. Uh, as you all know, I just came out of a heavy dagger phase, uh, which culminated in the purchase of the Randall made, um, uh, model two seven inch dagger i love that thing um uh in a second i have uh two questions from a patreon member uh one one of one of which is a really interesting question that uh, i never thought to ask uh but the other one uh is on my my list anyway so well, let's see 
Yes, that's the one I'm thinking so this of. This is the case reproduction of the V42 dagger. God. And I mean that thing is just just sexy, right? Yeah. It is. It is. I, I love the way the leather kind of comes up underneath the uh, the guard there. Doesn't that have a Yeah, yeah, it has yeah. the 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 leather under the the guard and uh, you know, it's all leather wrap or you know, stacked leather handle. Um, yeah, so the- I, I did a lot of research on these when I was wanting to make mine and talked to Les George in particular has a couple, yeah. he's, he's got a really nice collection. Um, talked to him a, a little bit and, uh, the guys at Spartan blades, cause they, they're a wealth of knowledge on these. And, um, you know, found out uh, at, at some point that the, the tool that they use to get this, the lines in here was the same tool that they used to put this finger groove or whatever they call it in the back of the blade and all these little things. Um, but I still, I, I still haven't completed mine yet. It's, uh, I, I don't have a big lathe. All I have is one of these little Sherline micro lathes, which I did turn one of those little pointy pommels on and it took me three days and it was ridiculous and I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> so I got to go find somebody with a lathe that I can saddle up to and try to figure out how to be a machinist and uh, make that. But the other stuff, you know, this is another one that I'm, you know, the old oh, Gerber, Gerber Mark, Mark II, II. Yeah. right? Uh, and then when, when you were guys when, from Spartan. Yes, know, yes. I have one of those. With, uh, yeah, I mean that's just that's amazing knife. I have the uh, I I was just saying as you got up to get that V forty two that I just came out of a, a a little dagger phase. It was little because I first got that Spartan Harzi dagger and then I I got the Randall made Mark to, or the Randall made Model two with the oh. seven inch and oh, yeah. uh, and that 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 <laughs> that sort of cashed me out. Uh, but I mean to me such a classic a beauty. I, I love that knife. And the, of course the Fairbairn Sykes, my brother got me one, I think it's over this shoulder, uh, for Christmas last year, which was an awesome gift. Yeah. Um, I need one of those two. <laughs> yeah. That's the next one. So your, yeah. your, your stage is not quite done yet. You, no, I did pick up my, my latest one though, is the oh, old the EK act- commando that, uh, that K bar is doing now. So I picked this one up I don't know, last month. I stopped at a shop out in Arizona and I was like, oh yeah, got to have that. That'll, that'll go nicely in the drawer. So, <laughs> so I got a, I got a question for you. Um, and, and, uh, one of, one of my patrons wanted to at, wanted me to ask this. Do you have any, um, manufacturer collaborations in the offing or any, any, um, ideas on how to mass produce, uh, any of your designs? He's uh, one of our followers who, who really digs your work. God, I wish. Um, there may be something in the works with one company was supposed to go off this year and they're just super busy. So it got pushed. I'm not going to mention names cause sure. it's not done. Um, that is something I would, I'm, I'm really interested in. Um, I just haven't been able to, to make it happen yet. Um, I would love to, work there's you know there's there's a few companies in the in the u.s that i'd love to work with um i've thought about doing the overseas thing and i'm just kind of like eh, no i i don't think i'm gonna go that route oh uh, mm-hmm. you know i want to keep it domestic but um it's been really hard I, i'm not one of those people that gets on the phone and you know just cold calls people Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm hoping the shows come back this year and next year and, you know, gives you, gives us the opportunity to get out and start doing some networking again and, yeah. um, you know, meeting people and, and doing all that. And I, I am completely down for having, you know, having my stuff produced, you know, certain designs, you know, I don't, I wouldn't go, you know, all in on one company. I don't think but right. you know, it's. I, I'm I'm working on it. So uh, will you be at Blade or Blade West this year? I will not be in Atlanta. Um, I will be uh, at Blade West in some capacity, either up there just checking it out or having a table. Um, 
not sure which route I'm going to go on that yet. Cause honestly, I haven't put the legwork in to find out what the table prices are and stuff. Um, and hopefully the USN show comes back to Vegas this year. If they do that, you know, that's always a, always a blast. So, uh, for right now, uh, I'm tentatively doing Vegas and, and Long Beach, uh, or, you know, like I said, in some capacity in Long Beach. Um, and then next year, you know, I think th it seems like there's been enough movement in the, the show locations and the schedule, you know, you've got a lot of stuff going on in Nashville now. Mm -hmm. Um, what is it? The, the, the TKI that moved to Nashville. Yeah. Um, and I think there's another, I think there's another show in Nashville too. I'm not sure. I keep seeing them on all these different posts and everything. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I, before the world ended and, and we got hit with COVID, you know, I would do three shows a year and that, that was doable for me. You know, unfortunately they all seem to cram up within six, you know, six weeks of each other. So it's yeah. like, my wife hated it. It's like, what are we going to do for summer vacation? We're making knives. <laughs> uh, Cause we got to go to Atlanta. We got to go to Vegas. We got to go to, you know, Anaheim or whatever. So, you know, it'd be really cool if these guys could all kind of get together and space them out a little bit instead of, yeah trying to compete with each other to see who has the biggest show, but I don't think that's going to happen. It so. also makes it hard to get interviews that time of year. Everyone, oh, no, yeah. no, 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 working on this. Hey, uh, yeah. I, I, I have uh, I have one more question from, sure. from a patron, um, Mr. Filato. He, he asked, wanted to ask that other question too. He's an, uh, he's an awesome guy, but anyway, this is an interesting question. He wanted to ask about your logo and if there's any symbolic significance to it. Uh, no, it's <laughs> so when I first started out, uh, one of the guys I was stationed with on the East coast, um, did a lot with, uh, Photoshop and we're sitting in the office one day and I'm like, Hey Drew, can you come over the logo for me? And he's like, what do you want it to look like? I'm like, ah, I don't know, a, a logo. So he worked on it and it's actually two K's. One of them is inverted and rotated and then he just kind of merged them together into the little blair witchy looking thing <laughs> that we have there um so drew kiermeyer is my hero if you if you see this drew thank you um but no there's nothing there's nothing behind it other than you know i need something to put on my knives that's different I, I really like the way it looks from a distance. I mean, I like how it looks close up there too, but yeah. uh, when you, when you look, for instance, in that, that picture of the blade, it looks like an upward pointing arrow. And to me, that's like, you know, that's uplifting. What can I say? Yeah, I, it's, I mean, it, it was one font that I found like when I first started doing this and, you know, I, I built my own etching machine, you know, I wanted to do this and be just to, like be a hundred percent independent on it. So mm -hmm. I found some schematics for, to make a, an etcher. So drove around like three counties in Northeast North Carolina, looking for parts, hitting radio shack up and built this etcher and then made a stencil exposure unit. And, you know, really, I just really wanted to do everything myself on it. And, um, that was just the, you know, searching through all these fonts, trying to come up with something to put on the logo. And I'm like, oh, skulls. Oh, uh, this, you know, and <laughs> I don't know. It, it's probably copyrighted or patented or something. And I'm probably going to get sued for it eventually. Somebody will figure out, oh, that's our font. So don't tell anybody. No, 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 certainly not. <laughs> so Eric, before I let you go, how can people get in touch with you? How, how does one buy one of your knives? Uh, right now, Instagram is the best way to get a hold of me. Um, and you guys are pulling stuff up on my website and I apologize. I'm the, uh, head knife maker, floor sweeper, coffee maker, <laughs> tech guy, email answer, or lack of, if you've tried to email me and I, haven't replied. I apologize. I, I'm not really good at doing all of that, but I also do my own website and it's horribly out of date. Um, there's a lot of the stuff that I'm making now that I haven't updated it with. Um, I think I went through and took 
prices off because the last time I looked, the prices were like from five years ago. <laughs> People, uh, like so <laughs> yeah, so Instagram me, hit me up on a DM on Instagram or or even Facebook if anybody still uses that. Um, I you know I have those are my two main things that I work through. Um, my phone number is on the website. Call me. That won't come back and bite me in the ass, will it? Um, it? I generally will not answer a call if I don't recognize the number. So if if you call me, it goes to my cell phone, leave me a voicemail, and I will get back to you. Um, but I get a lot of the IRS and everybody else is calling me from with really funny accents that sound like they're made out of a computer lately. So <laughs> I just don't answer my phone if, unless I know the number. But you know, my phone number is up there. Call me. You can email me to, to Kramer custom knives at gmail.com. Um, or, you know, hit me up on the, on the, on the Instagrams. Awesome. Well, Eric, it was a pleasure meeting you and talking uh, with you about your awesome knives. I'm, I'm such a fan and, uh, I'm, I gotta get on whatever list you have. Um, uh, like I said before, I think right now my, uh, it's a double-edged voodoo that I love, like you were showing before. Uh, but also I love the, um, the do no harm. I also love the name. <laughs> so, um, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really Thanks appreciate it. Thanks for having that. me. I appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure. Take care. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. There he goes, Eric Kramer of Kramer Custom Knives. I'm I'm a huge fan, as I divulged many times, but I love purpose-driven knives, uh, whatever the purpose happens to be. Uh, in this case, you know, I love the fixed blades. I've been on that kick for a while, and uh, never really goes away. But you know how collecting can go through phases. Um, definitely check out Kramer uh, Custom Knives on Instagram. It's eye candy through and through. And uh, well, it was a real pleasure to meet him. Uh, please do sure, uh, be sure to join us next Sunday for another interview of another awesome knife maker. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a great thing, I think, for me and hopefully for you to get to know uh, who these people are behind this uh, passion that we have. Uh, so for Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, don't take doll for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.